I'm going to date myself here and ask if anybody remembers from McDonald's back in the day, they had the shake-up salad. It came in a cup, anyone? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. Yeah, Miss Sharon, I see you. Okay, it came in a cup, like a Starbucks cup, you know what I mean? From like, with the Frappuccino, like back in the day when they had the cone, you know, dome Frappuccino top. And they would give you this salad and taped to it were all the goodies, you know, the dressing and maybe some, I don't know, croutons or seeds or something. And you threw it all in there and then you shook it up. And it was really exciting. And you're like, oh, what are we going to get here? Right? Anyone ever like love that experience? I loved it because you could, it's, it was like a choose your own adventure. You know, like if you want to leave the seeds out, you do you. If you wanted just half the dressing, that's fine too. You know, like I really do think like McDonald's like needs to bring back the shake up salad. Um, <laughs> but I will say this, that the past 18 months has felt like an enormous McDonald's shake up salad, right? Have you felt that way? Like back in March, I still remember it because my husband and I were celebrating our anniversary on March 10th and then all of a sudden, we weren't going anywhere for a long time, like within two days. And I will not forget this time that we've had in this 18 months. And in all honesty, we're really, we're not through it yet, but it feels like we're kind of like getting back to some sense of new normalcy, right? Praise the Lord. Um, and I'm excited about where that journey is going to go. But I honestly think that in that McDonald's salad shakeup, um, we just, we were like thrown off. We were thrown off. I mean, throw in a pandemic, your kids are home, and you're homeschooling. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> It's true. I was, a, I was a teacher for 18 years, and I'm like, oh, these kids got to go to school. You know, like, I was, seriously. I mean, homeschool teachers, moms, dads, God bless you, okay? I just want you to know, you are my hero. Yeah. I am not worthy. Um, quarantine, homeschool, masks were like a whole shakeup, right? Like, can I go to Target with my, you know, like, do I... Do I have to wear my mask or not wear my mask? I think around Memorial Day this year, I felt like, oh, like, let's see what happens if I step, I'm fully vaccinated, but I was like, what happens if I step into Target without a mask on? Like, am I gonna like get clobbered? You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know. It's just, everything feels like this. Oh, let's just throw in a crazy volatile political season. Yeah. You know, insane. and. The greatest measure that we have of how people lost their minds was Facebook. <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? All of a sudden, like, people are, like, saying things on Facebook. And as Pastor Rashad has said, it's like, it's like keyboard courage. You know, like, people saying things. And I'm like, I don't want to hear that, like, from anyone, you know? And it's like, I can't, I can't, I can't throw my mind around it. But here's the thing. I know we've been shaken up, but in all honesty, this is a time right now that I want to invite us into to take a breath and assess where we are and to look at Jesus and see how we need to move forward. Do you hear me? This summer is a perfect time, especially before the kids go back to school in a month and all the things start going haywire, you know, because schedules and busyness, for us to stop and assess, see where we are, and see where Jesus wants to move us forward. Because here at Mercy Road, we are passionate about living on mission. And a couple weeks ago, I explained that, that living on mission, if you've never heard that word before, it really means just sharing the heart of Jesus with other people and what that means to you. It's not really much more complicated. It's just taking that wherever you are. If it's at work, if it's at the gym, if it's at Starbucks, if it's at the McDonald's shake-up line. I don't know, I'm just saying. But in all honesty, it's a great time to stop and assess where we are and how we want to move forward. Because you and I have a mission. And if you have Jesus in your life, your mission is to share Jesus. 
because he is the only one worth sharing in all honesty. I know there's a lot of like really influential people out in the world and they all got something to say and everyone's got an opinion, but the only one I want to lift up is the one who died for me and made a way for me to live on purpose and for a purpose forever. That's powerful. And when we look at how we can do that, Jesus gave us some calibration tools. This is big, grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. So when we say grace for today, I want you to think of it this way. Grace, I love you no matter what. I love you no matter what. Everyone say that. I love you no matter what. And truth, I will be honest with you no matter what. Say that with me. I will be honest with you no matter what. Now notice it's grace and truth, not grace or truth. It's both. And when we look at Jesus, the word tells us that is who he is. And that's how we get to calibrate our mission in life. And these, I think, are very foundational things for us, especially right now as we reassess and we are looking to move forward in the mission that he's given us. Because he's not done with us yet. Right? We got a lot more to go, praise the Lord. And I can't wait to hear the stories of what he's doing and what he's gonna do. So do me a favor, open up your Bibles or if you have it on your phone, we're gonna open up to John chapter one. I love the apostle John. He's known as the beloved disciple. He's the one, this is how close he was with Jesus. He like would sit next to Jesus and just like lean in. He's known for like putting his face on Jesus's shoulder. Is that the sweetest thing? I want that kind of relationship with Jesus or I just feel like it can lean in. And so because John had such an intimate and powerful relationship with Jesus, um, he reveals a really unique perspective about who Jesus is. So John chapter one, verse 14 tells us this, that the word, the word meaning Jesus, became flesh, became a person, and made his dwelling among us. Now, I love that part. If you read the message version, it says that he moved into the neighborhood. He moved to where you you and I are, wherever that is, right? And then it says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. There's only one. It's Jesus who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I want to talk about this word glory really quick before we dive more in. But glory comes from the Hebrew word hadar. Hadar, it's interesting. And if you look at it in the Bible um, and you look more deeply, there's dictionaries and stuff. You can look it up. And it means splendor and majesty, honor, awe-inspiring. This is glory. But it has a semicolon next to the definition, and I love a good semicolon. I was an old English teacher. Semicolon is my favorite punctuation because it says, oh, there's more, right? And it says, a combination of both social position and attractiveness. Jesus represented and walked and showed us because it was who he is, the glory of God the Father. He made him real in a person which is profound. So when we get lost and we're like, life is crazy, I'm scared. We can look to Jesus and experience God's glory. And the glory was full of grace and truth. So those are our calibration tools. If we look at it this way, we could say that God's glory was positioned through Jesus to bring dignity in a way that transformed the world. And we get to be on mission to do that. So let's pray, and then we're gonna jump on in. You ready? Here we go. Lord Jesus, you have so much for us. And I know that we have felt like 
we've been shooken up in a way that um, we just feel wobbly. Lord, I thank you so much for your word, for your son Jesus who made you clear for us that when life is crazy and we're trying to get our feet underneath us, that it's clear in how to do this and why we do this in your son, Jesus. Lord, just open our hearts right now and let us hear your word and let us walk out of here a little differently than the way we walked in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so open up to John chapter eight. John chapter eight. And we're going to look at kind of a a difficult scenario that occurred. Jesus, at this time, was teaching and preaching. He had done a lot of miracles and things like that. And so he was well-known. He had this following. People followed him, right? And we get to this point where he's teaching in one of the temples. Now, on the other hand, we have the, the, sorry, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the teachers of the law handed down from Moses thousands of years prior to this. And they were like the gatekeepers. You know what I mean? Like, raise your hand if you're someone who's like, I like rules and I like everyone to follow them. Anyone? I know you. I see you out there. Yeah. God bless you. Um, The Pharisees were those people. And that's good. We need people like that because otherwise people like me would go off the rails. You know what I'm saying? Ryan is seeing me go off the rails. Um, I need people to like keep the, the guardrails. You know what I mean? The Pharisees were that, but here's the thing. They were so obsessed with the rules that they lost sight of the people right in front of them. And so when Jesus came, they didn't even recognize him. In fact, they were so jealous and scared of him that they just were plotting to kill him. They're like, we got to get this guy out of here. He's going to take our power and our control. And that's a very frightening thing. When we are so just inundated with what we think life should look like, that we forget Jesus already showed us a way, right? And so, very interesting, the Pharisees were trying to trap him in this situation. And so take a look at verse three. It says, the teachers of the law, which is the Pharisees, they brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, this is a very vulnerable position. Wasn't right, wasn't good, But they grab this woman in the middle of this very, like, intense thing, and this is what they do. They made her stand before the group in the public square and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, let's do a hard stop there for a second, because if you go back and you look at the law in the Old Testament... The man should be stoned too. It takes two to tango. But they were trying to make a point, and it didn't matter if they were right or wrong in their eyes. They wanted to make a spectacle of her. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Friends, when our backs are against the wall like Jesus is right now, like, what do you say? What are you going to say about masks? What are you going to say about vaccines? What are you going to say about who should be president? It's a trap. It's a trap. And when we are in those traps, we all have a tendency to lean one way or the other, to, to react one way or the other, you hear me? And it's either all grace or all truth, or we're just like, I'm out, okay? And a lot of us experience this over COVID, am I right? You either like came hard at people, you're like, this is the way it's supposed to be, or you were like, we gotta just love everyone, or you were just like, I can't handle it, I'm out. 
Let me talk about the problems of those reactions for a second. If we are all truth and no grace, we are creating a culture that is stressed out. We are creating a culture that says you have to perform to my standard for my love. In a culture of all truth and no grace, we forget about the human being in front of us. Now, I'm go can I be real? I'm a Hamilton County mom. I'm going to just be real. I'm going to call us out for a second. Um, we live in a culture of parents where we stress our kids out. They got to do everything to succeed. You got to have straight A's. You got to take all AP classes. Um, you have to play the sport. And you better go D1 because I'm paying a lot of money for you to play all those club sports. Right or wrong? Yeah. Now, some of us have handled that a little bit better. But it's really the pressure that we feel of like, perform, perform, perform. And our kids, I'm telling you right now, I've talked to way too many kids who just want to take their lives because they can't meet your standard. When I was a kid, a lot of you know that I danced as a kid and I was loved to perform and it was just like, I couldn't stop smiling when I was dancing. Like that's how much joy it brought me. And then when I started getting kind of good, um, I was performing in this company all over the country and then all of a sudden it became a job. And I remember the day, and we were teenagers at this point, um, this company that I was in, and I remember the day that um, our director pulled out a scale and said, okay, every week, we're all gonna line up and we're gonna get on this scale and we're gonna get weighed, because some of you, you're getting a little too big. And we've got a standard to meet. And we would get on that scale and we would be praised if we lost weight. And if we gained weight, we would be put in the back of the different dance routines that we did. Now, here's the thing. I know that at the time, this was the best that our director knew what to do. I mean, he was just trying to perform. But I will tell you as a result of that, and probably some other things, I started losing weight like you never saw before. I was like, I want, I want to be good. I want to be the best. I had full-blown anorexia my junior year. And my mom did not know what to do with me. She was scared. And because of that, that kept going through college, it took a long time to get that out of my head, that I was worthy and loved as I was. Friends, we have to be careful of the all truth and no grace, that's a problem. The other problem that we have is not just all truth and no grace, is all grace and no truth. This is swinging the other end of the pendulum. And here, we just want to love everyone. We, want, we create this culture where there is no standard, right? There is no like thing to move forward to because you're all good just as you are. But we all know that the Bible tells us in Romans that we've all sinned, all of us. And so grace just says, come hang out as you are, but don't, don't change. You're okay. Don't ever change. Now that's messed up because I need changing. What about you? I want to be transformed. I want to look different tomorrow than I do today. But all grace just says, come as you are and stay there. That's not how Jesus interacted with us, right? I tend to lean this way, to be totally honest. I know I sound like I'm like hardcore. I'm not. To be totally honest, I tend to want to just embrace everybody. And I do. I think, I, I think like it is my heart. It, it is what I do. But I have learned that I have to calibrate truth in that as well. Grace is the invitation. And truth is the honesty that points us to the next step. 
But here's the thing. My husband and I have seen this over the political landscapes of our, of our marriage. Steve grew up in a very conservative Christian home. He grew up going to church probably two or three times a week. I mean, he did a wanna, he had his Bible memorized, all the things. Some of you know that I did not grow up like that. I grew up in a very liberal household. Um, I was in a single family home and we didn't have a lot of resources. And although I feel so blessed to have the diversity of relationships that I, was available to me then, I wasn't super safe. I didn't have safe people in my life looking out for me. It was anything goes. And so when Steve and I got married and voting time comes around, we noticed that we voted differently. And so this is hysterical. We made this rule because we were arguing too much after the first political election that we were married and we decided hard, fast rule. You do not share who you're voting for with each other. Like you do you and I'll do me. You know what I'm saying? Because it just was like this. And I thought he should feel this, and he thought I should feel that. And it just was like, but I love you. It doesn't matter. We'll figure it out. But I, can I be honest with you? We broke that rule <laughs> this past year. And I am super glad that we did, because I'm not gonna lie, we argued. We made each other cry. Steve cried too because we offered a perspective of grace and truth into one another's lives that changed us and didn't just leave us in our silos, but it helped us see the world in a bigger way. Was that painful? Yes. Do I regret it? No. So all grace is a problem. All truth is a problem. But there's one other problem that we have here, and it's the problem of disengagement. And this is, in all honesty, the thing that like hurts my heart the most. Because if you're all grace or all truth, I at least like, I know you're feeling something. You know what I mean? But disengagement says, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to hang out with my friends or my family and we isolate, and we form patterns of like just comfort that's just not good because we don't go anywhere, and we weren't made for that. I was at a wedding a few weeks ago, and um, here's the loaded question that people will ask me. What do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, and you just, you know, like for a number of reasons, I, you just don't know what you're gonna get, what kind of reaction you're gonna get. It's kind of like <laughs> waiting for <laughs> pins and needles. And so um, the gentleman said to me, he was an older gentleman, and he said, oh, I'm sick of that church stuff. And I was like, oh man, I'm so sorry to hear that. Tell me more. You know, it's my question where I'm like, just trying to like invite people into a, more of a conversation without reacting. Um, and he said, I'm tired of the evangelicals and the conservatives and the liberals. I just, I'm just playing golf on Sundays. And I was like, oh, I was like, how's that working for you? And he was like, it's great. I don't have to deal with anything. Here's the thing. Jesus came from heaven to earth to deal with us. Do you think that that was super cool? I just thought it was a circle. I was like, okay. And I was like, man, I would love for you to consider like what it would look like to re-engage. And he was like, bah. But I can pray for him. I don't have to like make something happen for him. God's bigger than that. He's got him, but I can, my heart can break a little bit because of the community that I love has just been all over the place and we've confused people in the world because we've been either all grace or all truth and Jesus calibrated it right in the middle. Let's take a look at how he did that 
because the story is not over, tells us, but Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He got in the dust with this woman who is ready to die, ashamed, broken, scared, and looked up at all these people standing around them, her, and said, go ahead, throw the first stone if, if you're so perfect. Here's what happened. It says that this, those who heard began to go away one at a time the older ones first, because our older ones are wise. They know. And so only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there, and Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I. I don't condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. He surrounds her with grace, but he doesn't leave her there. He points her to truth. Go and sin no more. That's what living on mission looks like. It's grace and truth. Not grace or truth. And that's big. This is good news for you and me, because in all honesty, how many times have you felt like you've messed up and you've been in the dust? And you're like, I don't know if I can go on anymore. I don't know. Maybe it was an extramarital affair for you. Maybe it was an argument that was, just wasn't worth it with a family member or a friend or a neighbor. And you know it. <laughs> Maybe it was the time that you were just a little too hard on your kids and you feel this small in the dust. And Jesus came down into the dust. And if you remember in Genesis, you know how we got life? We were formed from dust, but it was his breath that gave us life. Can I get an amen? amen. And that we can get up and take the next step and sin no more. I gotta be honest. That sometimes happens a few times in our lives, right? It's not a one-time deal. And guess what? Jesus will come down every time and say, I love you. I love you no matter what. And I will be honest with you no matter what. This is good news. Because Jesus took the rocks for you and me. He took those rocks. He went on the cross and he took it willingly. And he even said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he rose to heaven and he showed us the next steps of where we're going if we just have faith in him. And then it's not even over yet. He then said, okay, now I'm going to give you me through the Holy Spirit. And now guess what? You get to go be me out in the world. You want to know where we need to go next? We need to go do that. We need to go be grace and truth because the resurrected God gave you that power. You don't have to be afraid. Do you hear me? You don't have to accept everything. But you can stop and take a second and get down and remember what that feels like. To be dirty and scared and condemned. And then Jesus gives you the dignity to stand up and move forward. That's all of us. Am, am I right? Yes. All of us. And not just for those of us who are in this room or listening online, it's for everybody in the world. And we get to show that to people. I don't wanna be the object of people's love. 
I'm not good enough for that. I want them to see that. That's how we move forward. So I want to invite you right now. Here's what I want you to do. You ready? I want you to ask yourself, where do you lean? Are you a little, do you tend to react more in the truth side? Or do you tend to react in the grace side? Or do you just disengage? Where do you lean? You know, right? I want you to also think of the person. I know we all have at least one person. If we close our eyes and think about it, who fell away from our lives this year because we've just reacted and we haven't calibrated our grace and truth that we see in Jesus. And so I'm going to ask for you to consider reaching out to that person and asking forgiveness because you've been forgiven. Be humble. And the last thing is to act on it. Do it. Imagine what you can do on mission by just doing that one thing, how you could change someone's world. Just look around. Look at all the people and all the people online. If we all did that for one person, that's, a, that's a change. That's transforming the world. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. Is it worth it? What do you think? What do you think? I think it's worth it. I think it's the next right step for all of us. So I want you to do it. And I want to pray for you right now so that you feel Jesus, the Jesus inside of you when you accepted him into your life to go and have the supernatural power to do hard things. You got this because he's with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I can't thank you enough that you gave us life when we felt like dirt. Jesus, you gave us a mission of not just grace or truth. You gave us the mission of sharing your glory that is grace and truth. Lord, I know we have all felt all over the place and we've had moments of reaction but Lord you forgive us we're asking for forgiveness where we know we have just kind of reacted and it wasn't of you Lord thank you for forgiving us for that Lord you're not done with us you have a step forward for us and that is to reach out to the people who have disengaged from our lives or their relationship with you, Lord. And we get to just say, I'm sorry, and be humble and listen and invite them to the next step. Thank you that you're not done with us and that you have a mission for us. And it is so good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.